Good evening and welcome, everyone. My name is Antonin Scalia. I'm the communications coordinator of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. And welcome uh, to this first event co-sponsored by the James Madison Program and the Ethics and Public Policy Center, the, the first, I hope, of what will be many fantastic events here in our nation's capital. Uh, before we get started, I, I wanted to give a brief run of show so you understand what, what your money has bought you. Um, and, and that is, well, <laughs> that's right. It was, yeah. Some of you got it. Um, we'll, we'll start with Ryan. Ryan will deliver remarks, giving a general overview of the arguments uh, that he and Robbie put forward in their brilliant uh, 2019 National Affairs essay, The Baby in the Bathwater. Uh, Robbie will then speak about the relationship between America and the framework that they, that they set forth in that essay. And then we'll have a discussion uh, be between the four of us before we open things up to all of you. And for that audience question and answer session, the way we'd like to do that, you all have note cards and pens on your chairs. So as questions come to you, please just write them down there. And at about uh, 6.30, uh, Debbie Parker, the program manager of the Madison program, and one of our uh, uh, EPP seers will go around, collect those note cards, and bring them up to me there. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like at this point to introduce uh, Robbie and Ryan and Alexandra, three people uh, from whom I have learned so much and for whom I have so much respect. Uh, Robert P. George is the director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University, and he holds the university's celebrated McCormick Chair in Jurisprudence. He has served as chairman of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, on the President's Council on Bioethics, and as a presidential appointee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights. He has also served as the US member of UNESCO's World Commission on the Ethics of Scientific Knowledge and Technology. He is a former judicial fellow at the Supreme Court of the United States, where he received the Justice Tom C. Clark Award. And here's the fun part of his bio. He is a graduate of Swarthmore College. He holds <coughs> MTS and JD degrees from Harvard University and the degrees of DPhil, BCL, DCL, and DLIT from Oxford <laughs> University. I could list more. Ryan T. Anderson is the president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center and the founding editor of Public Discourse, the online journal of the Witherspoon Institute up in Princeton, New Jersey. He is the author of several important books, including When Harry Became Sally, Responding to the Transgender Moment, and Truth Overruled, The Future of Marriage and Religious Freedom. He is also the co-author, along with Robbie George and Sharif Gurgis, of What is Marriage? Man and Woman, a Defense. He is the John Paul II Teaching Fellow in Social Thought at the University of Dallas, a member of the James Madison Program's James Madison Society, and a Fellow of the Institute for H H Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Princeton University and his doctoral degree from the University of Notre Dame. Alexandra De Sanctis is a visiting fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and a staff writer for National Review. She hosts the National Review podcast for life. Prior to becoming a staff writer, Alexandra spent two years as a William F. Buckley Jr. Fellow in political journalism with the National Review Institute. Her work has been published in the Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The Washington Examiner, America Magazine, and The Human Life Review. She is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming these three distinguished guests and welcoming Ryan Anderson to the stage. Thank you. Great, well thank you Nino, and uh, thank you to all of you for, for coming tonight. Uh, I just wanna, um, in you know, a few minutes, give a brief overview of the essay, but more importantly, like the, the arguments. What, what inspired Robbie and me uh, to write the essay, what do we see going on in the American political landscape today, especially the landscape on the right. Um, and one way that I like to describe it is that there are three Johns, um, John Locke, John Stuart Mill, and John Rawls. And many people seem to think that these three Johns are America, and that somehow they embody the American political tradition. Uh, and what this means is that the uh, John Locke 
uh, that they read is the Leo Strauss Habizin uh, John Locke one of just natural rights, no uh, divine workmanship, but all self-ownership for John Locke. Uh, the J.S. Mill, the J.S. Mill of the harm principle. Uh, John Rawls of no comprehensive doctrines. Uh, the John Rawls of uh, anti-perfectionism, neutrality between competing visions of the good. Uh, and they somehow think that that uh, political tradition is the American political. Uh, the reality as I see it, as Robbie sees it, is that America is much more than just John Locke, and that the John Locke that the American founders read was not Leo Strauss's John Locke. Uh, it was the divine workmanship John Locke, it was the John Locke that came out of uh, the common law tradition, the natural law tradition, uh, medieval thought, uh, ancient thought, or at least they read him as in keeping with that, even if he himself was breaking from it in various ways. They were people who were synthesizing ancients and moderns, biblical tradition, enlightenment, philosophy. And then, of course, John Stuart Mill and John Rawls, uh, to my mind, are utterly foreign to the American political tradition. In fact, in various ways, um, they were trying to reform uh, and distort the American political uh, philo philosophical tradition. And normally, Mill and Rawls are cited on the left, so I'll focus on the Lockean debates. It strikes me that there are some thinkers on the right uh, right now who view um, America as Locke, understood as libertarian, no common good, just the protection of private individual rights, and that that Locke is the real America. And they only disagree on whether they think that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, so there are certain voices on the right who see America as fundamentally libertarian, liberty maximizing, private right protecting, and they cheer it. And there are others who see that, and therefore they've soured on the American project. Um, it strikes me that both of them get some important things right, but they get many important things wrong. So what we wanted to do in our essay was offer an alternative philosophical foundation, an alternative way of thinking about politics in general, and therefore of evaluating contemporary American uh, debates. Uh, on our account, political philosophy is a practical discipline uh, concerned with how do you protect human dignity and promote human flourishing. Uh, that is, how do you promote the temporal common good, the common good of the political community. Uh, and I say it's a practical discipline, meaning that it's concerned with concrete action in the here and now, given all of the givens, given all the various hurdles that we face, all the various challenges that we face. It's not uh, purely an ideal uh, philosophy. And so what this means is that protection uh, for human liberty are going to be important, uh, both as aspects of human dignity and human flourishing, and as a mechanism of effectively channeling and therefore limiting political authority to accomplish its task of promoting the common good. And so uh, to think about this, in order to create the right political institutions and structures, you need to both empower government and limit its power. You're going to need both of these things. Um, the technical academic jargon for the philosophical school that Robbie and I kind of find ourselves in is pluralistic perfectionists. Pluralistic perfectionism, we're pluralistic perfectionists. And that's an account of both public morality and civil liberties. It's a subtitle of one of Robbie's, I guess it's Robbie's first book, Making Men Moral. Subtitle, Public Morality and Civil Liberties. You need both. Uh, and we see the various warring factions on the right right now as emphasizing one to the exclusion of others. And this explains a lot of the various circular firing squad that you see going on. Libertarians go wrong in thinking that liberty is the only or the highest good that politics is supposed to um, promote. Uh, and then various thinkers who are souring on the American project in the name of the common good go wrong in depreciating uh, the rightful role that liberty plays both in human dignity, human flourishing, and the structuring of political power. Now, if the word liberal, liberal is a trigger word for you, if it's a stumbling block for you, just don't use it. And if you hear someone use the word liberal, ask them to define their terms. Hmm. Um, because I think a lot of this, when people, you're a liberal, that's liberal, blah, blah, it's, it's, it's not using uh, the same word with the same meaning across the different usages where you see this play out. And so I want to ask you this question. If, if, if you kind of, if, if, if you are of the position that America is fundamentally liberal, liberal is fundamentally bad, which of the following uh, American political institutions do you reject? Representative government, separation of powers, constitutionalism, limited government, respect for the autonomy and integrity of institutions of civil society, starting with the conjugal marriage-based family, the jury trial, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, protection for private property, et cetera, et cetera. 
Robbie and I argue that most of those, if not all of those, precede the birth of John Locke. Right? He's not the philosopher who invented uh, that long list of American political institutions. And more importantly, even if he were, uh, they're better defended on Aristotelian and Thomistic philosophical grounds than they are on Lockean or Kantian grounds. But most importantly, they're effective in the here and now at protecting human dignity, promoting human flourishing, given the nature of the uh, American populace, the diversity uh, with the pluralism, with the disagreement that we face. So the question is, which of those would you do away with? Which of those do you think is the kind of uh, hallmark of a liberal regime and therefore tanks the entire American project? But asking you what you would do away with, what you reject, might be putting it too strongly. Right? So more precisely, what we should be asking is, how should each of those institutions be structured to best promote the common good? I don't think anyone really wants to get rid of any of those institutions. The real debate is going to be at the margins. What are the limits? All of our liberties have limits. And the debate is going to be, what are the limits? All of our institutions need specification. Um, and that will mean that these institutions aren't just about maximizing liberties, but structuring power in ways that truly promote and protect the authentic common good, given all the givens. So let me give you a couple of examples that we discuss uh, in the article. We talk about civil liberties such as the freedom of speech and private property. These things don't just spring forth from human nature. right? They're not abstract natural rights in the sense that you can um, sit in an armchair, philosophize about them, and then write a constitution. Right? You need to both reflect on human nature and the way that uh, political civil liberties like the freedom of speech, like respect for private property ownership rights, need to be structured. You actually need to craft a legal code. You have to have limits. What are, do fighting words count as freedom of speech? Does obscenity count as freedom of speech? In the American political tradition, the answer is no. Right? What we're um, uh, concerned with protecting is the exchange of ideas, the exchange of arguments. That's the freedom of speech that we're trying to protect, not um, uh, uh, obscenity, not pornography, not fighting words, not incitement to violence, et cetera, et cetera. And they don't enjoy First Amendment protections, nor should they. Likewise, you can have various time, place, and manner restrictions. It might be perfectly fine um, to give public lectures, but you probably shouldn't be doing it uh, at the middle of the night in a residential neighborhood with your boombox. It's a time, place, manner, not a content restriction, et cetera, et cetera. Private property, we can go through the list. There are all sorts of ways in which our acquisition of property and then our deployment of property is going to be limited by regulation. Some of them are wise, some of them are not wise. Some prudent, some not prudent. The debate should take place on those grounds. And that means you're going to be, need to be attentive to human nature and human flourishing, but also attentive to human nature and human fallibility. You're going to need to be attentive to the ways in which fallen human beings can both use and abuse government power to either promote or to undermine the common good. And we need to be sensitive to both of those aspects. Uh, we then discuss uh, uh, questions of church and state, free exercise of religion, um, there are some thinkers who uh, want to argue that the problem with America is that we don't have an established church. The Catholic Church is not the established church, uh, and that explains all of our nation's ills. Um, they may be right. I don't know how you establish the Catholic Church in the here and now, given all of the givens and the fact that only 20-some percent of Americans are Catholic. Right? And so we actually have to think, given the givens, how do we promote true religion? How do we promote uh, people to know and love and serve God, given the actual conditions. Let me read you two quotes. One uh, from, actually it's going to be three quotes. One from Pope Pius IX in 1864 from the Syllabus of Errors. So he's condemning this proposition. He's condemning, quote, it is no longer expedient that the Catholic religion should be held as the only religion of the state to the exclusion of all other forms of worship. That proposition he condemned. A few years later, 1895, Pope Leo writes to the Americans, praising the American bishops and the American church and all the success it's had in flourishing, but he says that the church, quote, would bring forth more abundant fruits if in addition to liberty she enjoyed the favor of the laws and the patronage of public authority. So for Pius IX, Leo XIII, the problem with America uh, was that things are going okay, they would go even better if the law favored the church, not just the free exercise of religion, but actually some form of uh, establishment, some form of legal uh, uh, privilege from other faith traditions and from other ecclesial communions. All right, now consider Pope Francis five years ago. 
Uh, Pope Francis writes, there's a difference, or he spoke, there's a difference between secularism and secularity. Vatican II speaks to us of the autonomy of things, of processes, of institutions. There is a healthy secularity, for example, the secularity of the state. And here he's echoing Pope Benedict. And then he continues, in general, a lay state is a good thing. It's better than a confessional state because confessional states always finish badly. Now, I think neither Pope Leo nor Pope Francis are uh, giving us their dogmatic, always at all times, all places, uh, bottom line, truthful accounts. In some situations, confessional states end badly. In other situations, they might not. In some circumstances, you could imagine that the American Catholic Church would flourish better if it had patronage of, of the state. But in other circumstances, you might think it would just get corrupt, like has happened to many European churches that had establishments, right? This is gonna be a prudential question. It's gonna be one based upon experience, not based upon um, just uh, uh, theology or philosophy alone. All right, and that just brings me to what I wanna close with. I think much of these debates have been rather um, uh, intemperate, partly because many of them are taking place on social media, uh, where people aren't exactly prone to give their best, uh, most reasoned judgments. It's frequently people type in with their thumbs in anger. Um, I also think a lot of this involves um, drawing distinctions between kind of ideal theory and applied theory. Um, what would an ideal state look like versus what's the best state we can hope for, um, uh, you know, this side of paradise. And so that means we should recognize that there are problems with philosophical liberalism. I think there are deep philosophical problems with Lockean liberalism, Kantian liberalism, Millian liberalism, Rawlsianism, et cetera, et cetera. And there are problematic tendencies to politically liberal societies but they're problematic tendencies with every type of society because they're human societies and we're fallen. And there's not gonna be a human society that doesn't have a problematic tendency. And so the question for constitution makers, the question for policy makers is how do you temper those tendencies? How do you create the best institutions? And then given that any institutions will have uh, side effects that you don't want that are undesirable, how do you best temper those? It strikes me that this is gonna require us to actually return to some of the insights of the founders. Uh, they distinguished liberty from license. They would distinguish the blessings of liberty from the abuses of liberty. And that's meant to be a criticism to both sides. One side of the debate seems unable to distinguish between the blessings of liberty and the abuses of liberty. The other side seems to refuse to celebrate that there actually are blessings of liberty. Uh, we need to be able to do both. We have to do it as friends, not as enemies, as we have these discussions. Um, and it strikes me that we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Professor George. The first thing I would like to do is thank all of you for uh, coming out this evening. It's so good to be able to get together in person. We're not through this COVID thing completely yet but how wonderful it is not to be looking at you all on a screen, but <laughs> having you here in person. So thanks for signing up and thanks for coming out. Uh, the second thing I wanna say is uh, I, I look over here and I think, wasn't it just yesterday that I was the youngster? <laughs> <laughs> and sitting over there might be Richard John Newhouse and sitting right there might be Jean Bethke Elstein and sitting right there might be Leon Cass and I would be the kid at the table so blessed to be with such brilliant people. Now I'm the old guy, but still so blessed to be with such brilliant people. They're our future and they are fantastic. So I'm so pleased that uh, Alexandra and Nino and Ryan uh, are here and even more pleased that they and so many other of our young intellectuals are doing the work that they are doing. I kind of feel my generation, that generation in between the greats and this rising generation sort of let the side down, uh, but uh, we're coming back strong uh, with, these, <laughs> with these kids. Uh, third thing uh, I want to say is that I'm so uh, happy uh, as the director of the James Madison program to be co-sponsoring this event with the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and I hope that this will be the first of many yep. events that we co-sponsor working uh, together our uh, two great institutions. And having mentioned the Ethics and Public Policy Center, I, uh, I want to lift up, I want to hold up the great Ed Whelan who led the Ethics and Public Policy Center with such distinction. He saved it, I was on the board, I remember it very well. He saved the Ethics and Public Policy Center and then built it up into such a great 
uh, institution, and then managed to hand off the leadership position to the great Ryan Anderson. Ed, thank you. Ed has not retired. He's still uh, plugging away as a senior fellow, distinguished Scalia fellow of the uh, Ethics and uh, Public Policy uh, Center. And then fourth, I want to say thank you to the staff of the Ethics and Public Policy Center for their work on this and the staff of the James Madison program, most of whom are here today. Yeah, I'm biased, but I think the James Madison program is just the best thing going in American <laughs> education these days. And whether I'm right or wrong about that, I'm certainly right about this. The Madison program has the best staff in higher education. Brad Wilson and uh, Debbie uh, Parker, uh, Amy Nash, Nino uh, Scalia, uh, Julia Schwartz, uh, Alan Gelzer, the great Alan Gelzer, the great Lincoln scholar who's joined us now at uh, Princeton in the Madison program as our uh, director of our program in politics and uh, statesmanship. I hope I'm not leaving any staff members out, but I'm grateful to all of you uh, on the Madison program staff for all the work that you put into this long distance to make this happen. Now fifth and down to the substance. Uh, my message this evening, the message really that Ryan and I were conveying in our article, The Baby in the Bathwater, really boils down to keep the faith. Keep the faith. The American idea is fundamentally sound. It's fundamentally good because it's fundamentally true. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's not a noble lie. That's not just pretty rhetoric. That is literally the truth. Now, it's not the whole truth. There's more that's got to be said, but it's fundamentally true. And however badly we have, from the beginning, with slavery, however badly we have deviated from that principle and our other basic founding principles, We've never gone wrong by being too zealous or too faithful to our principles. We've always gone wrong when we have been unfaithful to those principles, whether it's slavery at the founding and all the way through till abolition finally with the 13th Amendment, segregation, whether it's abortion today, Again, the denial of that principle of the profound inherent and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family, the core principle of the Declaration. No matter how far we've gone wrong, we've gone wrong because we haven't been faithful to the principle. And we can always be proud of ourselves. And the proudest moments of our history have been when we were faithful to the principle. So we need to keep the faith. That's the baby that we don't want to throw out with the bathwater. The baby is that core American idea of profound, inherent, equal dignity. That each and every human being bears it just in virtue of his or her humanity. Not because you're an American, not because you're a member of a particular race or class, just because you're a human being. The American idea is an idea of universal human dignity, not just for Americans, for all men and women, everywhere, at all times, in all places. And what's exceptional about America, here's another thing that we need to be faithful to. Another thing about America is our exceptionalism. American exceptionalism today gets attacked from the left and the right. But my goodness, friends, let's not throw it out. American exceptionalism doesn't mean, as people on the left claim it means, that we think we're better than other people. We're more virtuous, we're more intelligent. That was never it. American exceptionalism is that, it's the proposition that we are different than other nations, most other nations, historically different from other nations because we were founded and our unity is based on not blood and soil, or throne and altar, not a common ethnicity, not a common long cultural history, not a common religion, but on a shared commitment to those great founding principles, 
the principle of the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family. A principle, by the way, that didn't just get discovered one day. A principle that we can trace to its religious foundations. And when we trace back, where do we find that foundation? What is the understanding that anchors that view? It's in biblical religion. The very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible, which tells us that man, human beings, unlike the brute animals, though made from the dust of the earth, mere dust of the earth, is nevertheless fashioned in the very image and likeness of the divine creator and ruler of all that is. So that's how we got there. That's what's at the foundation. Despite all the deviations and all the failures and all the going wrong and all the forgetting, it's this long tradition that feeds the American founding. When Jefferson was asked by Henry Lee, where did you get the ideas for the Declaration? Now Jefferson, the most secular of the founders, not as his critics uh, accused him of being an atheist, but, but the, the most secular, I think it's fair to say, of our founders. Uh, certainly an Enlightenment figure, uh, someone who uh, had uh, unfortunate uh, sympathies uh, for the French Revolution until it became impossible because the facts became so clear of what the French Revolution was really all about that nobody could have sympathy for them. Uh, but somebody who hung on to that for a while, even Jefferson, doesn't just point to Enlightenment figures like Locke and Sidney, though he does mention them. He points to the broader sources, even back into classical antiquity, the Greek and the Roman sources. Certainly the biblical sources are there, Athens and Jerusalem. Which is why Ryan and I in The Baby in the Bathwater are at pains to point out that we should not suppose that the basic liberties that sometimes are associated with the label liberalism predate modern enlightenment ideology and find their roots in an earlier tradition, the broad tradition that uh, sometimes referred to as the natural law tradition. I find at this stage uh, in my life, now that I'm one of the old guys, the most surprising thing is that I, who from the very beginning, since I was their age, <laughs> had always regarded myself and was certainly regarded as a critic of liberalism. My, my, my first book, to which Ryan kindly referred, Making Men Moral, Civil Liberties and Public Morality, was and was regarded as a vigorous attack on liberalism. So I wasn't a liberal. The big surprise is now, at this stage in my life, to be thought of in some circles as a liberal without having changed a single view. If you want to criticize me, criticize me for being stodgy. I go back and I read Making Him Immoral. I can't find anything to disagree with. I haven't changed and yet. Then I was a critic of liberalism and a conservative and now I'm a so-called liberal. How did that happen? Well, it shouldn't have happened because as I argued in chapter six, the concluding chapter, or was it seven? <laughs> the final chapter, whichever it was, of making men more, it might have been eight. As I argued, our defense of a rich substantive conception of the common good, something identified correctly with the broad natural law tradition, need not and should not lead us to illiberalism, to authoritarianism, to a denial of basic civil liberties, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, due process of law, equal protection, private property, the market economy, respect for the authority and autonomy of the basic institutions of civil society, as Ryan said, based on starting with a marriage-based family. My argument in the book is we don't need 
so-called anti-perfectionist liberalism, liberalism that claims that we should be neutral about right and wrong, that we shouldn't make law based on any conception of what makes for it detracts from a valuable and morally worthy way of life. That's a dead end. I argued that that kind of neutrality is neither desirable nor, strictly speaking, possible. Even the great figures in the tradition, up to and including the great John Rawls, ends up smuggling in a certain progressive, liberal conception, substantive conception of the human good, all the while claiming that it's illegitimate to do such a thing. So my argument was, we don't need to embrace anti-perfectionist Rawlsian liberalism or any of its predecessor liberalisms in order to have a rich defense of civil liberties. In fact, we can provide a better defense on perfectionist grounds, on grounds that recognize basic liberties, basic rights, not as trumps on the pursuit of the common good, as Ronald Dworkin and other of the great liberal theorists of that time argued, but rather as aspects, irreducible parts of the common good. Now, how do we go about doing that in America? How does the American constitutional scheme provide for both civil liberties and the common good, the substantive common good, including the good of public morality? Well, those of you who've studied constitutional law, Brother Whelan, for example, know that our constitutional system vests only a limited jurisdiction in the national government. This was an innovation, a new idea that our founders gave us, that the national government would not be a government of general jurisdiction exercising plenary authority over all aspects of American life, exercising so-called police powers. No, the national government would be a government of delegated and enumerated powers, therefore a government of limited authority, limited to certain roles certain ends articulated in the Constitution, principally in uh, the uh, uh, eighth uh, section of the first article of the Constitution. The states, by contrast, would hold the general jurisdiction. They would be governments of general jurisdiction exercising police powers to protect public health, safety, and morals. And every single American founder Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and the ones you haven't heard of, maybe Governor Moore, all of the American founders understood that states possessed police powers and that those powers were directed to the pursuit of the common good, understood substantively, including public morality, not some Rawlsian anti-perfectionist idea of the so-called common good where states, government, would be forbidden from acting on the basis of controversial conceptions of what makes for it detracts from a valuable and morally worthy way of life. You know, folks, that's one heck of a good idea our founders had. And it's a great way of protecting liberty while at the same time letting us as a Republican people, today we say democratic, the founders favored the word Republican, as citizens of a Republican democracy, a way for us to make law, to uphold the common good, to respect basic civil liberties as aspects of the common good, founded and defended on the substantive conception of the good not defended on the idea or on the basis of the idea that uh, there should be neutrality as between competing ideas about the human good. Why should we defend free speech? Because free speech is required if we're to pursue truth, if we're to communicate with each other in ways that enable us to run a Republican democracy. There are substantive goods served by free speech. On that point, Ryan John Stuart Mill was right. He's wrong about a lot of things. But in chapter two of On Liberty, his perfectionist account of freedom of speech is right on. Why should we respect freedom of religion? So that religion can flourish. It's the substantive good of religion. Why should we respect the other basic civil liberties? 
because respect for them redounds to the benefit of we the people, of flesh and blood human beings. It's those liberties, it's that concept of the common good that is the baby. And we shouldn't think that you need to embrace some desiccated liberalism in order to uphold or support those goods. There are very good non-Lockean, non-Rawlsian, natural law reasons for supporting precisely those liberties and that conception of the common good. Thanks to everyone. Well, well, thank you, Robbie, and thank you, Ryan. That, that was really fantastic. Uh, at this point, we're just going to have a brief discussion. If you have any questions, please go ahead and write those down on the note cards, uh, and some staff will be a along shortly to, to pick those up. Uh, my mother is in the crowd, so I'm going to play the gentleman and uh, pitch the first question to Alexandra and let her take it from here. Sure. <laughs> thanks, Daniel. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, so I'll start with what I think is perhaps the most important question and maybe the most difficult question. Uh, and that is, what is the common good, or what are we to do when we don't agree on it? And I think one of the, the biggest criticisms your argument receives from uh, particularly critics of liberalism is, uh, aren't we too polarized to even talk about the common good anymore? How are we supposed to have a politics oriented around the common good when, when people can't even agree whether a man is a man or a woman anymore? Um, and, and how are we supposed to orient a politics uh, productively in that way? And so if, in fact, we are too polarized, to agree on the common good, how are we to address that um, when, making, when making your argument? Can we become a political society again uh, where we can have those types of discussion, discussions productively oriented towards a better, making a better society? Who do you want Whomever, to go uh, Ryan, why don't you sure. take it, I guess. Um, Give Robbie a break. <laughs> so I mean, I, I don't think there's any alternative. I mean, I think you're correct to say that we are polarized, but we're just as polarized in our discussions about rights. We're just as polarized in our discussions about liberties. Right, so you can say that the child has a right to life or that the woman has a right to choose, and we're polarized about that question and we're framing it in terms of competing rights. We're also gonna be uh, polarized when we discuss about the various goods at stake that the competing rights would protect. Um, I think philosophically what's foundational are the goods, that the rights are at the service of um, the goods, and so we're gonna have greater long-term success um, if we at least make not just procedural arguments, not just rights-based arguments, but also substantive arguments about the good that we seek um, to promote. Um, that's what we've done in you know, our various uh, writings about life, about the nature of marriage. You know, the first question, what is marriage? If you wanna say there's a right to marry, I agree, but we have to know what marriage is. If we're then gonna answer the question of who has a right to get married, everyone has a right to get married, but not everyone has a right to claim whatever consenting adult relationship they most favor is marital. Right? I mean, so, so these are, I mean, it strikes me that, that you can't get around um, those foundational questions. I mean, same thing is gonna be true with the transgender question. You know, what's the truth about our embodiment as male and female? Um, should public policy be based on biological reality or subjective identity, right? And again, you can't just say, well, I have a right to one or the other without addressing why. What's the foundation for why we should respect biological reality rather than subjective identity. The challenge is that, as you point out, we're very polarized, um, and that means we need to um, make arguments that are meant to persuade people who don't already agree with us. Um, and when we can use political power to uh, promote the good, we should, right? We shouldn't be afraid, well, if we use political power to promote the good, then the left will do it. The left's gonna do it no matter what. Like, we shouldn't be naive about this, right? When they are in power, they use their power to promote their conception of the good. And so I think the right um, is misguided when they're like, well, we don't wanna do this because then what will the left do if, you know, they're gonna do it anyway. Um, so we should promote the truth about the sanctity of life. We should promote the truth about the nature of marriage. We should promote the truth about our embodiment as male and female. Um, those are three aspects of the common good. I mean, part of um, the common good, the political common good is that it's multifaceted. Right? And so we could talk about what we need to promote true health, true education, true family formation, those are all gonna be aspects of a political common good where the ideal here is that you wanna promote human flourishing and you need various legal structures and other uh, programs to be at the service of that. If I can follow up, Alexandra, on something that uh, Ryan said. Uh, again, at this stage in my life, having been involved in these debates for, gosh, getting on for 40 years, 
uh, I find myself wondering about something. Uh, now we're at a point where the left, the progressive left, what uh, we might now call the identitarian left, the woke left, uh, has massive political, economic, and cultural power. Massive. Uh, David Brooks uh, says that the left has a monopoly on cultural power, and cultural power is a pretty big thing. And if that's a, an exaggeration, it's not much of one. It's a near monopoly. And we've seen now that the left, when it has this power, uses it. It uses political power, economic power, cultural power to legislate, to promote a substantive vision directly in violation of what leading figures on the left argued right. <laughs> for most of those 40 years and even 20 years before I came onto the scene. Rawls's book was published in 71, A Theory of Justice. So now I'm asking myself, did they mean it and change their minds, or did they never mean it? Was it just a way of toppling the previous, if I can use this term, regime or understanding of uh, the appropriate use of political power because it was in the hands of people who didn't agree with them? And once they got it, if I can quote uh, Hillary Clinton, forgive me, uh, it was that, that old Rawlsian anti-perfectionist uh, uh, stricture against acting on a substantive conception of the good was no longer operative. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I want to attribute good faith uh, to uh, my interlocutors. I certainly believe Professor Rawls was a man of good faith. Uh, but it is awfully suspicious. The minute they get power, suddenly the old rules no longer apply. Uh, on the substance of Alexander's point, I would say, Alexander, I think what we need to make sure and preserve agreement on to the extent possible, because we're going to disagree about the substantive good a lot, and this looks like it's going to become endemic. Yeah. Uh, we need some at least rough, broad agreement on Republican democracy as the way of resolving disputes, at least tentatively. The great thing about Republican democracy is there are never any permanent losses. There are also no permanent wins. You can always come back and appeal to your fellow citizens again and say, look, we need to rethink this. We've gone down the wrong road. We've made a mistake. We need to go back. So the preservation of Republican democracy and the preservation of civil liberties. Those who have cultural, economic, and political power now are trying to compromise Republican democracy and are trying to compromise civil liberties. If you shut down civil liberties, if you shut down dissent, then the game's over. Now, here there are good people on the left. The left here is having a fight yeah, I mean. internally. There are good people who are out there really in the forefront of trying to defend freedom of speech, for example, on college campuses, uh, for example. Uh, Cornell West and I joined together in 2017 to put up the statement, truth-seeking democracy and freedom of thought and expression, in, we, in which we, he from the left, I from the right, give a very robust defense of freedom of thought and, and expression as necessary both to truth-seeking in academic institutions and to uh, Republican uh, democracy. Uh, same with Republican democracy uh, it, it, itself. Th this is why rule by judiciary is such a bad thing. You know, uh, then it's just all a question of who's going to control the uh, uh, control the courts. So that's that's my answer. We've drawn this distinction between sort of liberal philosophy and then liberal practice, the institutions. Um, and I'm curious whether we can actually have a distinction like that, or do these institutions, like the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, do they necessarily allow an opening? for the philosophy, for the theory to come in. So you'll hear an argument, and I know you've heard arguments like this. They say, you defend the freedom of speech and you open up the, the library, the public library, to the Catholic and to the Satanist, to the, uh, the pro-life group and to the drag queen story hour. And what you've tacitly done is acknowledge that both are equally worthy of protection and equally worth hearing. 
How do you respond to that? Can we differentiate between these two? Yes. Let, let, let me, let me, so is the short answer. <laughs> You're making me nervous there for yeah, a second. Yeah, yeah. Right? Let, 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 me, um, let me say more. So I mean, I think this is what I was getting at by saying that there are certain tendencies. Like, I don't think it's an inevitability. I'm not like a Hegelian that you know, there's something in like this zeitgeist, the spirit that's going to. I don't think that's how it works. I don't think it's like an inevitable logic that's just working its way out. I think some people overstate. Um, those sorts of arguments. But I mean, I think start the list with Plato and Aristotle. Anyone who has ever analyzed different political regimes recognize, and then include the list go up through Montesquieu, right? That there are different tendencies. I mean, he, he would say different spirits, right? But the idea here being that, um, look, if you have an aristocracy, if you have a monarchy, if you have a democracy, if you have um, capitalism, if you have socialism, there are going to be various habits that they cultivate in citizens. And you need to account for that, right? And so this may be that this is the least bad political regime that we've discovered yet, um, and so we should support it. We should also not be Pollyannish and pretend that it's the perfect regime yeah. or it's the ideal regime. Uh, and then we just want to think about, right, so what are the tendencies that it inculcates in citizens, and what can we do to counteract those? And some of those counteractions might come from the state itself. Some might come from non-governmental institutions. I mean, this was Tocqueville's point about, you know, this is only going to work if you have strong civil societies. Uh, institutions. Um, I don't think to say that both um, the Catholic and the Baptist gets to worship means that they're equal. Right? To say that they both deserve equal protection is not to therefore say that they're both equally true or equally good. Um, and I don't think any of, uh, maybe some, right? There, uh, Jefferson might, I mean, there, there probably were some founders who actually thought like this would be helpful, it would do away with popish, superstitious religion, yada, yada, yada. I think others fully saw that, look, we have vital disagreements about what religious truth is, and the only way to peacefully work those out is to protect both competing truth claims. But that doesn't mean that both competing truth claims are equal. And there's a difference between saying they both equally deserve protection and um, that they're both equally true. Um, I think that obscenity doesn't get protected. right? And so I, I don't think you have to um, uh, lump in um, you know, Playboy or things like that under freedom of press. Right? I think you could just straightforwardly say, like, nope, that's not, no merit to it, and we can do away with it. And we used to enforce our obscenity laws. We no longer do. It would be nice if we did. Yeah. Robbie? Uh, yeah. Um, it seems to me that uh, we have very good reasons. Uh, for the preservation of democratic republicanism, for the preservation of the truth-seeking vocation of scholars and teachers and of academic institutions, both state and private. We have very good reasons for having very broad protections for freedom of speech. These include the right to advocate for views that you or I think are erroneous. I think we have very good reasons. And there are very grave dangers, it seems to me, and these are among the reasons for needing broad protection. There are very grave dangers to allowing the governmental restriction of speech or allowing university officials, at least where you don't have a university that's committed to a particular sectarian uh, view, to, uh, uh, to shut down uh, speech. But that certainly doesn't mean that anybody thinks, anybody who advocates for broad protection for free speech thinks that all speech is equal or there's no truth, quite the opposite. The reason that we should respect freedom of speech is not because there is no truth, but rather because there is a truth, and the best way to get at the truth is to have robust discussions and dialogues, engagements. All of us right this minute, everybody in this room, everybody in the world, right this minute has some false ideas in their heads. I have some, you have some, everybody has some. Throughout history, people, everybody's had them. Um, so you might say, okay, well, if that's true, because we're all fallible, right? None of, if I ask which of you is confident that every belief in your head right now is true, not a single hand would go up. Um, uh, so why don't you swap out your, your, your false beliefs for true beliefs? And you would answer me by saying, well, but Robbie, if we knew, I would, but I don't know which ones are true or which ones are false. Now, the only way you're gonna get in a position to swap out the false ones for true ones is if you allow yourself to be challenged, if you allow somebody to question your beliefs. 
or they can poke and, 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 and prod. And we've all had the experience of, of moving from error or misunderstanding to deeper understanding to truth because we've been poked and, and prodded. Now, I'm not among those who believe, as some liberals do, that uh, if we have robust protections for free speech, the truth will win out every time. We don't live in a world where that's reality. But I do believe that we have a much better chance of getting at the truth in circumstances of freedom where we can poke and prod each other, we can challenge each other, we can be challenged. A much better chance, it's not a guarantee, it's not a lock, but a much better chance. And so I get myself in trouble by articulating this, which is in fact what I uh, believe. Uh, there are some people who think that you, know, you should have drag queen story hour for kids. Uh, and of course those people also think that it, you should be able to advocate drag queen story hour for kids. And then there are some people who, who think we shouldn't have drag queen story hour for kids and we should not permit people to advocate drag queen story hour for kids. And uh, this is a funny place for me to be. I'm the moderate who thinks we should not have drag queen story hour for kids any more than we have Ku Klux Klan hour for kids. But people should be able to advocate and they'll have me up against them making the counter argument, pushing hard. They should be able to advocate for that. If that makes me a liberal, I'm a liberal. Let me highlight one thing uh, based upon what Robbie just said there, because I mean, what he's suggesting there is that the law should be based on a substantive, true account of the good there. Uh, oh, so that wasn't on. So, uh, so for those who couldn't hear, what I was saying is that, like, I just want to add one thing on what Robbie said there, is that he was saying the law should be based on a substantive, true account of what the good is, even while respecting people who disagree with that to give voice to their disagreement. Right? There, and so it's not a form of like, well, because we disagree about the good, we can't pass law that enshrines it. We disagree about the abortion debate. Robbie and I think we should pass laws prohibiting abortion, but we also shouldn't censor someone like Peter Singer from advancing his arguments in favor of abortion. Right? And that's, what, that, that's that middle position that I think people on both sides are, are, are uncomfortable with about us, is that we want to say you know, the law should promote the truth about the nature of marriage, it's a union of husband and wife, but we shouldn't be censoring John Corvino from publishing a book arguing against that viewpoint. In fact, John and I and Sharif, we've co-authored a debating book where we debated the respective positions. Um, I think that's the tension that is important to maintain and that people on both sides, uh, either the libertarian side or the um, kind of common good intention with America side, uh, seem to be parting from us. So if that is, in fact, a, a liberal view, if that makes us liberal, it's certainly not the liberalism of Locke, and it's certainly not the liberalism of Rawls. Right. Alexandra, you can jump yeah. back in. Yeah, if I might. So you mentioned abortion, and I know in your uh, remarks, Robbie, you talked a bit about federalism. I assume um, you, know, you talk a lot about the liberal institutions that we should value um, in the essay. I assume one of them is federalism. And if so, uh, what are we to, to make of the fact that the states, as laboratories of democracies, do and will continue to do things that are contrary to the common good as we understand it, contrary to the type of moral vision that perhaps we think the federal government ought to be advancing. Think of slavery or abortion. Uh, if, you know, make it concrete, if in Dobbs the court overturns Roe and simply sends the issue back to the states, we'll have 50 different abortion laws. Presumably the common good demands one abortion law that makes it illegal, uh, and yet federalism is a valuable liberal institution. So how do we reconcile that? Well, uh, the question of how we will organize things, like the decision I outlined of our founders to create a national government as a government of delegated and enumerated powers, and, and, and the states, leave the states as governments of general jurisdiction exercising plenary authority in the, plenary authority in the form of, of, of police power to protect public health, safety, and morals, is a prudential decision. Any different decision would also have been a prudential decision. Let's say they would have said, well, we kind of, you know, we don't like monarchy, but we sort of like the way in Britain there's a central government and then the powers of the counties and localities or municipalities is derivative of the central government or the way they do it in France. That still would have been a prudential judgment about how best to pursue the common good. It, it might be a wise prudential judgment. It might be an unwise prudential judgment. I think our founder's judgment was pretty wise uh, prudential judgment. But 
Either way, it's a prudential judgment. And either way, some things are not going to work out as they really should because we organized it that way. We could vest all power in the central government, and so on important questions, there's national law on everything. But of course, you might get the law wrong there. You can spread out the power, you can divide it up, use the states as laboratories of democracy. I think it was Brandeis who coined that phrase. We could do that, and some states might get it wrong, and some states might get it right. But there's no perfection here, and we mustn't make the perfect the uh, the enemy of the good. If I could return to just one point uh, to scandalize people further, if I haven't scandalized you enough, a point that Ryan made, uh, talking about Peter Singer, who, who defends not only abortion, but in, in, infanticide. Um, every couple of years, the disability rights people show up at Princeton. Uh, not to protest me, thank God, I'm on their side. Uh, at least there's somebody not protesting me. Um, but to protest Peter Singer because of his view that severely cognitively disabled people are, are like unborn children or newborn children are not yet uh, persons. Th this view, in my judgment, is abominable, uh, horrific, uh, reading some human beings out of the class of, uh, of, of persons and rendering them vulnerable to lethal, lethal attacks. So you can imagine that you know, when Singer and I are uh, on, on discussing that question, we're on radically opposed sides. And yet, I find myself, uh, when the disability people come and chain themselves, uh, some in their wheelchairs to the gates of Princeton University and demand that the president of the university terminate Professor Singer's tenure and fire him, I'm the one speaking out uh, in his support, in support of his right to articulate uh, his view. And I'll scandalize you even further, Ryan knows this, but. And, and Mitch Muncy and some, some of my former, Melissa Marcel, some of my former students know this, but uh, maybe others don't. I actually encourage my students to take not only my classes, but to take his. Uh, and he encourages his students to take not only his, but mine. And I assign his writings, as well as writings by people like Ryan, pro-life writings, uh, in my class. And he hires regularly as teaching assistants people who take the pro-life view. For all our differences, Singer and I both believe the same thing about how you do education on issues like this, which is presenting, making sure students are exposed to the very best arguments on the competing sides of questions. Now, I suppose that makes me a liberal, too. <laughs> so, so, can I actually ask a follow-up question on that? Because, um, I mean, there's a part of me that wonders, we want to limit government power in various ways because of how that could be abused and how in some circumstances um, you know, it could take a while to overturn a bad governmental decision. Um, but we don't want every university to be um, a, a free speech maximalist institution, or do we? Every, be every university? Well, I mean, uh, leave aside, um, I mean, Princeton used to be yeah, Christian yeah. of some flavor. So I was gonna say, you know, leave aside confessional universities. But I just mean, just as the university as such, um, so leave aside um, any particular confessional convictions the university has. So let's take Princeton today, where it's disowned its Presbyterian um, heritage. I mean, wouldn't it have been better uh, for Princeton to say, look, someone who philosophically advocates for bestiality and infanticide, that's simply beyond the pale in the same way that we wouldn't hire a philosopher who advocated for a racial caste system and who was in favor of philosophical racism because there are certain substantive commitments that don't deserve the prominence of a Princeton professorship. I mean, I imagine that you wanna say that like, there are some views that even a university like Princeton should rightly say, I don't care how rigorous you argue the case for philosophical racism, you could be a wonderful genius philosopher we're not giving you the platform, or not. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm forcing... supposed to believe that. Well, maybe you don't. I don't. OK. I, this, I think we've identified where you and I disagree then. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm on the uh, tenuring committee or the hiring committee, I do not vote to hire the philosophical racist. I don't care how rigorous if, the philosophical argument if is. That, if that philosophical racist is genuinely doing business in the currency of reasons, arguments, and evidence, now, if he's doing that, it's hard to imagine how he could get to where he is, but you've stipulated the facts, right. so he gets, to, he gets to where he is. And I'm allowed in my courses, and you're allowed in your courses, to present a contrary view, and we can engage each other. If you get a really smart, systematic racist like, 
like that. And, it, and, and take your stipulation. Rigorous. It's it needs very, to be very top rigorous. of his academic game. I'll, I'll tell you, the, the graduate students and the undergraduates that get to hear that debate, get to hear his side and my side or his side okay. and your side, are going to be the best educated students you'll find anywhere. Okay. If, we're, if we're really interested in educated, educating students, I want them to be exposed to radical ideas that are defended by the best people who are able to defend them. Now, I don't think there should be any just one sort of university. I'm a pluralist right. on this. I think that there should be Notre Dame, and there should be Wheaton, and there should be BYU, and there should be Yeshiva, and there should be Zaytuna, but there should be Princeton, and there should be Stanford, and there should be the University of Chicago, and so forth. And so I mean, I, I, you don't worry about the pedagogical effects for the students of what it does to legitimize someone Advancing Fine. those sorts Where of did arguments. You go to university, Princeton, I believe. <laughs> and at Princeton, there was me and there was Peter Singer, and we produced you. Right. Pretty good, huh? But there are. <laughs> but I mean, so I guess I'm just wondering. There are so people who came out of Princeton who are uh, in favor of infanticide. Well, yeah, that, that's right. They get, Wouldn't they, we rather they, they not be in favor of infanticide? Yeah, we would rather they not be in favor of infanticide, but we want people to be able to make the very best pro-life arguments that okay. they can conceivably make. And yours are better because you have read and thought about and engaged Peter Singer's work. So the limit to academic freedom for you is based purely on the academic rigor with no limits based on content, viewpoint, anything like that? Reasons, evidence, and argument, the proper okay. currency of intellectual discourse because that's what moves the ball along. What really makes me worry is when a university administrator at a place like Princeton that claims to be non-sectarian, that claims to be open to the range of ideas, is given the power to shut down some sort of speech. First of all, I know that the first person who gets shut down is not going to be Peter Sanders. No. <laughs> right, it's going to be somebody else. Yes. Uh, but beyond that merely prudential judgment, I think that the ball really is advanced when, in any particular society, uh, so long as the basic rules of uh, engagement are, are in place and are, are respected, reasons, arguments, mm -hmm. evidence, no demagoguery, we, we've had to manufacture your character. Right, right. So this person may not actually he, exist. He doesn't actually and, yeah. exist because you can't get to where he wants to get and read right. with reasons and arguments and so forth. I'm allowing you to have your stipulation. <laughs> Uh, in, a, in a university like Princeton or the University of Chicago or Stanford University, where you have that person presenting the very best arguments for a radical and extreme and we think very wrong position, but where people on our side can make the argument against it, doing business in that same currency, and we're really after the truth. We're, 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 we really want our students to appropriate the truth, not just be indoctrinated, not just be able to check the right box on an SAT score, pro-life or pro-SAT uh, test, pro-life or pro-choice. You want a depth of understanding. You want them to be able to make the kinds of arguments that you are able to make by virtue of having engaged Singer. Then I think the case is clear. This is amazing because we have four social conservatives on the stage and still have more ideological diversity than on most college campuses. It's incredible. But um, turning now, we have about 10 minutes left. I want to turn to some of the audience questions. And there's sort of um, two strands that we can find throughout. And the first goes something like this. And it's social conservatives have had so little success um, for their efforts in the cultural battles. Um, why have we been so successful? And what would you say to the, unsuccessful, yeah. And, and what would you say, Robbie, you, you already suggested a bit of an answer to this, but what would you say to those who are frustrated by our lack of success and have either embraced the power politics of the left, right? They say, well, the left is at war and you fools don't realize it. Wake up, start fighting. Um, they either say, embrace the power politics of the left or, Let's just give up on this whole thing. America's too far gone. It's this decadent liberal empire. To hell with it. What, what do you say to them, Ryan? Um, well, there's a lot that could be said. It depends if we're in private or in public. <laughs> well, I see cameras. If I've so been drinking or not. So, and I see, yeah. Um, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, I, I think one is that on many of these social issues, um, it's not so much that we didn't fight hard. It's that the rest of the conservative movement was not actively engaged on social issues. Hmm. Um, so exclude EPPC from your list and, and FRC from your list of major DC think tanks. And for most of their histories, 
there was not someone full-time dedicated to defending life or promoting marriage or working on religious liberty. Some of them still to this day don't have, you know, a, a scholar, you know, doing, you know, engaged on the right side of the transgender issue or the right side of religious liberty issues. Um, and so I think that's a failure of not so much our part, right? The social conservatives have done the best we could, but we weren't um, the senior partner of a movement, right? And, and I think that's, you can't deny that. I mean, that, that to a certain extent, they couldn't win elections without our votes, um, but they weren't, especially behind closed doors, advocating on our issues. I mean, there are stories that can be told about various senators who would campaign on their pro-life issue and then would make sure they never had to vote about right. it if it was a difficult vote. Um, and what took place on life, took place on marriage, is currently taking place on the gender identity mm -hmm. issue, is taking place on religious liberty issues when the going gets tough. Um, that's not a fault of America, right? That's not a fault of the Constitution. I mean, so, so when people see that dynamic and then they blame it on the separation of powers or bicameralism or the rule of law, that somehow you know, there's something baked into the American cake that explains why you know, various politicians or various think tanks were more beholden to economic conservatism than social conservatism. I, I think that is a non-starter. I just don't think that argument makes sense. Um, but I do think there's a problem with some of the conservative institutions, and so it's good to be um, asking some of those to reform and creating new ones. And in the case of EPPC, it's 45 years old, trying to elevate its footprint, elevates mm -hmm. its profile, um, flex more muscle, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, to the second part of your question is that that doesn't mean we should mimic the tactics of the left, right? That doesn't mean we should show at Brett Kavanaugh's house and you know, try to terrorize his family the way they did last week. You know, we shouldn't, after Bostock, we shouldn't have gone to Neil Gorsuch's house and like harassed his family. Right? That, that's not the way to do this. Um, but we might want to be thinking about um, as part of as we're um, uh, electing officials and nominating justices, what do we know about their convictions on social issues? Right? Um, and that's not a knock necessarily on Justice Gorsuch or the people who vetted him. It's just to say, like, I think that needs to be better built in to every one of our nominating, confirming, and electing processes. And it needs to be better built into all of the conservative institutions. And that's why you see, I think that explains a lot of the civil war going on on the right right now, yeah. is that many social conservatives are frustrated by how uh, what they derisively refer to as conservative ink pays lip service to social issues and doesn't actually um, effectively advocate um, on those issues. Mm -hmm. You know, my mother recruited me into the pro-life movement when I was about 13 years old. And in 1973, when Roe against Wade was uh, handed down, I was actually working a pro-life table uh, in Morgantown, West Virginia, where the state university is. I was in high school at that point. And I was working a pro-life table for a local right to life uh, group when a student came by. Of course, in those days, we didn't have internet and so forth. A student had heard on the radio that there was a big decision about abortion, and so a student walked by and he said, hey, you know, there's been a big decision from the Supreme Court on your issue. And, you know, we all ran, we ran, found a radio and tried to figure out you know, hmm. what this was all about and got the bad news that the Supreme Court had uh, struck down the abortion laws of all 50 states and legalized abortion. We didn't realize quite how bad it was because we didn't understand the full scope of the ruling. We thought it was for the first two trimesters, which is bad enough, hmm. of course, uh, it became clear as uh, people began reading the uh, opinion that it was more than that when Doe versus Bolton uh, was considered. Uh, but I remember at the time, it was widely proclaimed by liberals. In those days, there were still some pro-life liberals, but, but among pro-choice liberals, pro-abortion liberals, it was widely proclaimed that this abortion issue is now settled. It's done. Locked in stone, Supreme Court ruling, uh, abortion will be integrated into American life. It'll basically become acceptable. It'll disappear as a political issue. That'll be it. And I'll tell you what, Nino, an awful lot of conservatives, including strong pro-life people, believe that. But the tenacious pro-life movement, God bless them, disproportionately women, the pro-life movement wouldn't let it go and even defeat after defeat wouldn't let it go and kept up the fight and kept up the struggle and came down here to Washington, D.C. on January 22nd every year for the big march, like getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Media won't cover it. Media won't admit to the numbers or anything like that, but the pro-life movement hung in there, hung in there. And we're on the verge now of reversing Roe versus Wade. As you know, I've publicly predicted with no face saving <laughs> out for myself 
uh, that the Supreme Court will, in fact, uh, overturn Roe versus Wade in the Dobbs uh, uh, case. We're on the verge of revo reversing it 48 years uh, later uh, because of the tenacity of the pro-life movement, because they hung on, because they fought, because they had courage, because they wouldn't give up. So I don't think we've been all that unsuccessful. We have kept the, the, the dignity of the child in the womb. We've kept the principle of the inherent equality of every member of the human family in the forefront and kept it alive in our country. Probably the biggest defeat we've suffered was same-sex marriage. Yeah. And that's really sad because the arguments for reconceiving marriage that way were so weak, and yet they were bought overwhelmingly uh, on the left. And people on our side had trouble figuring out how to make the counter arguments. Yeah. And as I say, it's really sad because the, it really was just an incredibly weak set of arguments. But it wasn't really about the arguments in the end. I think the reason we lost on marriage, which has had such a demoralizing effect on our people, social conservatives, such a demoralizing effect on especially younger uh, social, social conservatives, uh, even you know, put us at risk of some people retreating back into pietism and quietism and thinking that, well, we should not engage with the world, we shouldn't worry about these political issues, we should, we should choose the Benedict option and go and hide in the monasteries and so forth. I think the reason we lost had nothing really to do with the arguments. What we lacked and what we need as a movement is the thing that makes the hot and tot so hot and the thing that put the ape in apricot courage. <laughs> we were not, the, our movement, most of our people were not courageous. They were afraid to make the argument, afraid to be called names, afraid to be subjected to abuse. The, let me, let me speak very clearly now. The big donors on the liberal side ponied up enormous sums of money to promote same-sex marriage, to promote this alteration of marriage law, something that was unthinkable even as, as, as recently as 1990, yeah. just unthinkable that the institution of marriage could be changed in, in that way. But the big donors on the left ponied up the money. The big donors on the conservative side, including Christian big donors with very few but notable and honorable exceptions, did not pony up. And I think a lot of that had to do with fear Mm. That if we pony up, we will suffer consequences, we'll be harmed, we'll be, we'll be accused of uh, bigotry, our businesses will suffer, and so forth. As a result of that, we were massively outspent, massively outspent. I think we could have won. I think we could have carried the day had we been outspent nearly two to one or three to one, but not six to one and eight to one. And, and let me, on that funding, I want to add something because you know, I've only recently discovered, like, do you know how hard it is to raise money? I have excellent colleagues doing amazing work <laughs> on the transgender issue. There's not like there's like foundations out there that make grants for you know really smart individuals at really good institutions to protect like the bodily integrity of children from transgender nonsense and the abuse of, of medicine. Whereas the LGBT left is flush with cash. After they won the Obergefell decision, they just pivoted to the T and the war chest that they had accumulated for marriage equality was now going to transgender equality. I would say many of our philanthropic institutions, funding institutions, they think of themselves as part of the liberty movement. And um, this is a tendency, right? This is, the American political tendency emphasizes liberty. We don't talk as much about virtue or about good, goods, common good. All of those things were present at the founding. But for whatever reason, we've chosen to emphasize one aspect to almost the exclusion, if not at least the diminishment of other aspects. And we have a club for growth. We don't have a club for virtue, yeah. right? Um, I, some people say social conservatives are too politically active. I'm like, no, we're not politically active enough. Yeah. Right? We actually rely too much on the institutions of civil societies. Like the left imposes their worldview through politics, and we don't engage enough in the political sphere, and we definitely don't have uh, the financial support to go toe to toe with them, right? and, and people are like, "Oh, you just oppose gay marriage for the money, or you opposed transgenderism for the." Like, Tell me who the donors are, <laughs> who are the institutions that are writing these checks, um, because the left has tons of people bankrolling this. Um, 
So there's, there's an asymmetry there as well. Yeah. And so we'll be passing the uh, collection basket around, <laughs> around, around shortly. Uh, we are, un unfortunately, out of time. We had lots more questions I would have loved to have gotten to. Um, a few closing uh, remarks. Uh, you can find out more about the Ethics and Public Policy Center and see their events. And when we have our next event, you can find information at eppc.org. And for the James Madison program, jmp.princeton.edu. Uh, there is free food and drinks right on the other side of these curtains. So I hope to see you all over there. And thank you all very much for coming out tonight. Thank you all.